Philippians. Thank you, James. Thank you, Verhaeus. Put our hands together a little louder for those guys. I get to follow that. That's fantastic. So we love the Ugandan Water Project. We love James sitting behind me and distracting everyone from the Word of God. <laughs> See you, James. Uh, but what a great mission we get to support when we support fresh, clean water for people in Uganda. And they do work even outside of Uganda, around the world. They're helping people have, have clean water. So we're just excited to stand with and walk with and run with and be carried by people with Uganda Water Project. Uh, one more thing I want to share before I get into the message, our first message, message in this new series. Oh, I lied. Two things. I wanted to say uh, we had our Married Life conference this past weekend. How many of you were at Married Life? Let me hear you. Yeah. So we had 70-something we had people at Married Life on Friday night and Saturday night for this great mini-conference, our first try at a conference, and it was such a great success, focusing on marriages. We are so excited about what God wants to do, is doing and wants to do through the marriages at Elam Life Church. And so let's keep thriving intentionally in our marriages. Amen? Amen. All right, so one last thing. I want to read this scripture that is uh, the focus of this announcement is power and presence that's happening tonight. Listen to this scripture. It's a very familiar one. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So it says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Power. Then it says, and surely I am with you always. Presence. If we're not first a church that seeks the power and the presence of Christ, then there's no way we can do what he's called us to do. We need to be about the power and the presence of Jesus. So just imagine being a people where our regular heartbeat, a regular drumbeat, is the power and presence of God. What are we going to be able to accomplish for Him? Who are we going to be in Him? So that's why every month, first Sunday of the month, we have our power and presence service. It's a chance for us to, to dive in even deeper into God, into Jesus, into the Holy Spirit. So that's happening tonight, 6.30 to 8, in the youth room. You can come early at 6 o'clock if you want to be here for pre-service prayer. But let's be a people that is passionate about the power and presence of God. Amen? Amen. All right. So we're getting into our new series, Philippians, one of my favorite books in the Bible. Hopefully it's one of yours. If not, it will be after this series. And as we get started, I want to I talk about something. I want to talk about something that's not fun for me. What's not fun for me is losing. Anybody else? Losing is not fun. I am very, very good at it, though. I'm very good at losing. Um, not that I enjoy losing. Like I said, I don't enjoy losing. Um, and not that I, I am always the best sport when I lose, but I'm very practiced at losing. I've done it a lot throughout my life to this very day. Uh, maybe not like today. Today is still early today. I'm still sure I'll, I will lose at something today. But I think you get what I'm, what I'm talking about. I lose. Does anybody else lose? Okay. Most, some of us in the room, we lose. Well, when I was a freshman in high school, I ran track. And I was, like the Verhaeus, very fast. I was little, and I was one of the, I was definitely the littlest guy in my class growing up, but I was the fastest guy for much of my elementary school career. And then when I got to high school, I got into track, and I realized that though my body grew, my fastness did not grow. And so I wasn't very fast when I was in track, and I realized as I'm, as I'm on the track team, I don't even like to run. What am I doing? And so second year, I switched from track to tennis. And in my second year playing tennis, that's where I got really, really good at not winning. <laughs> so, so here's the thing. I was okay. I was an okay tennis player, but my team was terrible. So what happens when you put an okay player 
on a terrible team. Oftentimes, the okay player has to play the best player from all of the other teams. Are you starting to get the picture here? This, this is what happened. And I lost. Match after match after match. I lost. I'd have fun in practices, but then I'd lose, and I'd lose, and I'd lose when we played any other team until the day I didn't lose because the other guy was injured. <laughs> if he wasn't injured, I would have lost again, for sure. I went through an entire season of JV tennis, an entire season. I lost every single match except for one that I won by medical forfeit. <laughs> I am very, very good at losing. Is anybody, uh, no, don't raise your hand if you're that good at losing. None of us likes to lose. We don't like to lose. Even if you're somebody who's, you're sitting here, you're online, you're watching this, and you're like, I don't have a competitive bone in my body. You still don't like to lose, to finish last, to be picked last. Like, no one enjoys that. So today, guess what we're talking about? Winning! We are talking about winning, everyone. That's what the message today is about. We are going to learn how not to lose as we start our new series through the book of Philippians. Today, we're going to start by learning a little bit about the book itself. And then we're going to dive into chapter one. Everybody say, winning. winning. All right, so we're going to start with an intro to Philippians. I'm going to give you some details here. Some of the details you might know about this letter that's written in the, in the New Testament. Some you might not know. As we, as we get into this book, we're going to be studying this book for four weeks. So I wanted this week to give you some context so that you could have better boxes in your brain for storing the information you're going to learn. So, like, where does this fit? Why did the author say that? What makes this verse especially meaningful? I now know, because I now have the box in my brain. I have the context for where this thing fits, where to put this information. So here we go. The, the author of the book of Philippians is the Apostle Paul. This is the guy who is persecuting at the beginning of the church. He's persecuting anyone and everyone who's a member of the church, any and every Christian he could get his hands on. And he was on the road to Damascus when he encountered Jesus, the one he found out he was persecuting. And that moment was a shift in his, in his perspective, a shift in his life. And he became just like the ones he was wanting to punish. He became a Christian too. And when that happened, after that transformation that he went through because he met Jesus— he went on at least three minute, uh, missionary trips, so three trips we read about in the Word of God, three missionary trips that lasted a total of seven to ten years. So his second trip was about two and a half to three years long, and it was on this trip, you can read about this in the book of Acts, it was on his second missionary trip that he had this vision. He was planning on going one direction, he had a vision of a man from Macedonia saying, come and help us. Come to us and help. And so he received that as the word of the Lord, and he shifted his, his direction, and that was the, the detour he was on when he went to Philippi, the city of Philippi, which is in Greece. So I want you to see the Google Maps view of where Philippi is located. You can check it out right there, in Greece. And here's what the city might have looked like, might have looked like according to one rendering. So check this out. You can have this in your mind. This is the spot where Paul was, was uh, preaching in Philippi, and this is the spot where the people from Philippi were when they read his letter that we're going to be reading this series. This is how Philippi looks today. So that road through Philippi, you can actually go to Google Maps, you can go to Street View, and you can drive through the ancient city of Philippi and see the ruins the way they look today. It's pretty cool. Here's a close-up. See the theater that's at the base of the mountain there? Here's a close-up of that theater. Now, it's, it's possible that Paul preached right in this very theater, but it's unlikely. As I was doing my research, I was hoping this was where Paul was. It was more likely that he was preaching house to house in the city of Philippi, not in this theater, but this is a prominent spot in that city, so I'm sure Paul was in this theater at some point. And then here's a close-up of one of the multiple basilicas or churches 
that was built in Philippi. Probably this wasn't there when Paul was there, but it was probably because of Paul's influence that this basilica was built. Now, Paul spent about three months with the Philippians during his trip that we read about in Acts chapter 16. So this was the trip where Paul met Lydia, who was the seller of purple cloth. It was also the trip where Paul and Silas, they're walking through the marketplace of Philippi, and that woman, who was possessed by a demon, kept shouting behind them, day after day after day, and finally Paul's like, I can't take it anymore, and he casts the demon out of the woman, and he got him and Silas arrested because he cast the demon out of that woman, so he's thrown into prison in Philippi, and that was the prison trip that he had, the, the, the stay in prison that he had, where he and Silas were worshiping late at night, and all of the chains of all of the prisoners fell off. The Philippian jailer was like, I am going to kill myself because I lost all of the prisoners. And Paul and Silas were like, don't do it. We're all still here. And the Philippian jailer gave his life to Jesus and his whole family got saved. That's all in the city of Philippi. That's all from, from that trip that he had to that place. Now, another thing that happened in those three months was that Paul developed this depth of relationship with the people in the church there. And we know that as we read through this book, the language that he uses in this book is personal. It's his, it's his most informal letter. Now, a lot of the letters that Paul wrote in the New Testament, he, you can read that he's like, he's like using his apostolic authority to address something. Like he feels like he needs to draw on that authority to address an issue, to address false teachers, and to turn that church around. But in this book, his love for the people just overflows in how he writes. You'll, you'll hear about it. Or you'll hear that and even feel that as we read chapter 1 in just a minute. But he wrote this letter to this people about 10 or 11 years after he was in Philippi. So 10 or 11 years later, he wrote it while he was under house arrest in Rome. This letter was likely the last of his four prison epistles or letters from prison that he wrote while under house arrest. Now, we like to, we like to picture Paul in a dungeon, in Rome. That wasn't the case. Paul wasn't in a dungeon. He was actually under house arrest in his own rented house. So you're like, oh, that wasn't so bad. But what was likely the case is that he was chained to a guard, a Roman guard, for two years in AD 62. Can you picture yourself two years in AD 62 being chained to a Roman centurion? Probably not super fun. Probably not a great experience. And yet he writes this letter that's full of joy and full of hope and full of love and full of optimism. After he's been imprisoned, chained to a guard for two years. Picturing Paul in this, in this mode, it made me think of this meme. <laughs> that's Paul, right? It's fine. Everything is fine. But Paul wasn't in denial, and Paul wasn't oblivious to his situation. He was just grounded in a deeper truth. Even though he was writing from his imprisonment, he uses the word joy over 16 times in just the four chapters of Philippians. It was clear that one of the things that he wanted to get across to the Philippian believers was that the foundation of their joy is, is deep. It's not circumstantial. They didn't need their joy to be circumstantial. His joy, that the depth that he had to be able to sit in those flames of persecution and say, it's fine. Everything is fine. That depth came from Jesus. In 104 verses in this book, 104 verses long, he referred to Jesus 51 times. And he's saying, guys, Jesus is my depth of joy. Jesus is my foundation for joy. He should be yours too. All right, that's the background. Now we know who wrote it. We can, we can imagine the people that he was ministering to as he, as he wrote this letter. We can even picture the place that he wrote it to, okay? When we were praying about this series, we thought it would be a great idea, even though we're not going to be preaching on every single verse through the book, it'd be a great idea for us to read through the book together. So today I'm focusing on chapter 1. We're going to read through chapter 1 as we get into Philippians. Let's start. This letter is from Paul and Timothy. 
slaves of Christ Jesus. I'm writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including the church leaders and deacons. May God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my requests for all of you with joy. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. It's like, we're partners, guys. We're in this together. And I'm certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So it's right that I should feel as I do about all of you. For you've, you have a special place in my heart. You share with me the special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and in defending and confirming the truth of the good news. God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. So you're, are you feeling this, this love that Paul has for this people? It's a special kind of connection he has with them. Now this next part that he's speaking, he says that he has a prayer for them. And this is my prayer for us too. I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. Here's a father in the faith telling his children in the faith what his heart is for them, that their love will overflow, that they'll understand what, what's truly important. They'll understand what really matters, that their lives will come alive and that they'll, they'll demonstrate the reality of Jesus in them. It'll look like on the outside what's happening on the inside. This is his heart as a father for his spiritual kids. Verse 12. And I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that's happened here, that's happened to me here, has helped to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, other versions call them the Praetorian guard, knows that I'm in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. It's true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. They preach because they love me, for they know I've been appointed to defend the good news. Those others don't have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely, intending to make my chains more painful to me. But that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way, so I rejoice, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that as you pray for me and the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, this will lead to my deliverance. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past, and I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ— and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be better for me. But for your sakes, it's better that I continue to live. Knowing this, I'm, I'm convinced that I will remain alive so I can continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. And when I come to you again, you will have even more reason to take pride in Christ Jesus because of what he is doing through me. Above all, live as you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. He's saying, live it. Live it so people can see on the outside what's happening on the inside. Then whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you're standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Don't be intimidated in any way suffering for him. We're in this struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I'm still in the midst of it. Paul is stirred up in chapter 1. He's encouraging. He's positive. He's optimistic in his perspective. He's a living example for the Philippians and, and for us, through his words, of what a life with Jesus can look like. Now, we started this, this message with a story. It was a story of drama an intrigue. It's a story about how good I am at losing JV tennis. But we ended the story hearing about how this isn't a message about losing. This is a message about winning. None of us likes to lose. It's about winning. How so? 
Well, this week I was reading this chapter over and over and over again preparing to speak with you about it this morning. And I was asking the Holy Spirit to reveal what is his heart. I asked him, God, what is your God thought that you want me to really wrap my mind and my heart around so that I can communicate it effectively to church? This is the main thing he showed me through Philippians 1. No matter what, we win. Why don't you just say that after me? Say, no matter what, we win. Here's Paul. I'm going to read another... Another little chunk of scripture from 2 Corinthians. This is Paul explaining to the Corinthian church what he had been through. He wrote this before he wrote Philippians, so we know he'd already been through this when he wrote what we read today. I have been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three different than today, right? Stoned means rocks thrown at his head. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I've traveled on many long journeys. I've faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long, endured many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. Who's weak without my feeling that weakness? Who's led astray and I don't burn with anger? If I must boast, I would rather boast about the things that show how weak I am. He goes on after this of more things that he's been through. And then he goes on to say, That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Where's his strength? He's not strong in his weakness. He's strong because of Jesus. Because Jesus is with him in his weakness. Paul went through some stuff, and what he learned is that no matter what, we win. In good times, we win. In difficulties, we win. Who's Paul addressing in this letter to the Philippians? The Philippians. Duh. But it's not just the people of Philippi. He's addressing Christians in Philippi. Those who are members of the church there. Which means who can apply this truth to their lives today? Christians. Those who have trusted Jesus with their lives. Is that you? Heck yeah, that's you. If you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can apply this same principle, these same truths to your life today. We're going to touch on just a few of the winning scriptures we read in Philippians chapter 1. Because I really want us to get this. I want us to get a new perspective that we don't have to be like me at tennis, good at, really good at losing. We're destined to win. We're going to start with Philippians 1.6. It says, And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. He's like, you can be sure that Jesus is going to continue his work in your life. No matter what happens to you, no matter what happens in your life, you keep your eyes and your life fixed on Jesus, you are going to grow. Some in this room right now, you're brand new Christians. And you're like, I have a long way to grow. Yeah, you do. Some, some of you in this room or watching online, you're, you're not brand new Christians. You've been following Jesus for what feels like forever. Guess what? You have a long way to grow too. Right? No matter where you are, no matter what position you're in, in your relationship with God, there's a long way to grow. In the hand of God, the plan of God is continually at work in you. There's always more. There's always more that he wants for us. There's always more he wants to do in us. So, it's like ears and noses. I did look this up this week. Did you know that ears and noses never stop growing? They don't. Some of you are like, darn it. It's true. They never stop growing. Just like you. God will never stop growing you. Never stop letting him. Say it after me. Say, no matter what, we win. 
Philippians 1, 7 says, You share with me the special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and in defending and confirming the truth of the good news. Paul's like, no matter what, you're in prison, you're out of prison, no matter our circumstances, you and I have God's favor. We live in God's favor. He's saying, I expect the grace and the favor of God to continue, even though I'm still in chains. I have peace. I have confidence. I have assurance that God's presence and power is with me no matter what I'm experiencing. And I'm expecting that you will have the same. We have Christian brothers and sisters all over the planet right now who are being persecuted for their faith. And we're starting to see it more and more in America as well. We're starting to see the perspective of, of politicians and famous people speaking against the truth that we know in the Word of God, that we know through Christ. And, I mean, there's a, obviously a good chance that that trend will continue. Who knows what we're going to face as the church in America in the months and years to come? But you know what? We have special grace. We have special favor from God, grace from God in every situation that we face, no matter what we face, just like Paul is saying, imprisonment and in defending, confirming the gospel, no matter what situation I'm in, I win. I have the special grace of God. Same thing with us. We can grab hold of that truth and say, no matter what, we win. Philippians 1.12. And I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. Everything. Paul's like, my imprisonment is helping this thing go forward. The guards are hearing the gospel. Imagine being the guard chained to Paul. If, you didn't get, if he didn't get saved, dude, <laughs> dude, it was hard-hearted. Right? Wow. The believers, he's saying the believers in this city are growing in boldness because of my example. Even people who are trying to harm me by sharing the good news of Jesus with bad motives are still progressing the gospel. He's like, this thing can't be stopped no matter what. It's the opportunity for the good news of Jesus to be shared, for the love and forgiveness of Jesus to be spread, which is such a great perspective for us. No matter what happens in our lives, good or bad, God gives us the opportunity to experience his love, his grace, his mercy, and to overflow it onto those around us. What's the mission of our church, of Elam Life Church? It's to experience the love of Jesus and give it away. To experience his love and exude it onto others. Sometimes exuding isn't a fun process, right? Like when you're driving down the, down the road and somebody's tailgating you, or you get rear-ended, you want to exude something, but it sure ain't Jesus that you want to exude in that morning, in that moment. But why not it be Jesus? Take that in for a moment. Why not it be Jesus? Why not in those moments of <laughs> where we feel like the darkness coming over us? Ah! Why not it, instead it be Jesus? Do you know that's possible? You know that's part of the growth that God wants to do in you? and in me, that it's less and less me and my pride and less and less me and my frustration and my anger and all the other stuff that's happening in my life working its way into my character and into my expressions to people. See, that's one of the things that he wants to do is work that stuff out and work himself in. That's part of the ears and noses thing. That's part of us always growing. Why not let it be Jesus? We've got this because we've got him. Say that after me. Say, no matter what, we win. No matter what, we win. Now, here's one more scripture from Philippians 1. This is a big one. This is the big one. You ready? Philippians 1, 21. For to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. Like, you're in church, and you hear that, and you're like, yeah? Well, duh, that's, yeah. Can you imagine being not a Christian and hearing that? humanist or whatever, hearing to live is Christ and to die is gain, and they're thinking, what the heck are they teaching in that Bible? What the heck are they talking about in that church? 
This is Paul not being ridiculous. This is Paul being confident in what we're talking about this morning. No matter what, we win. We can't lose. Are you in Christ? Are you a believer? You can't lose. Are you going through a difficult situation? Are you going through persecution, either personally or like, or like we're talking about culturally? You can't lose. What about the next half? Are you even facing death? Are you in the end of your life? You can't lose. This is the ultimate win-win situation. This verse says, to live is Christ. To continue on in this earthly life gives us more and more chance to know him, to grow to be like him, to live for him, and to lead others to him. Win. To die is gain. When it's his time for my transition from this beautiful planet, I'm with our ultimate loving Lord and Savior for all of eternity, at home with Jesus, no longer suffering in any way. Win. To live is Christ. Win. To die is gain. Win. No matter what, we win. Isn't that incredible? The perspective that we're getting from Paul in Philippians 1 is earth-shaking and our life-changing. You know the picture that I get here? Take your pick of any action movie where the main protagonist, the main hero, is a self-confident beast. You know the ones I'm talking about. Where, where they can't lose. The whole time you're watching this movie, you're like, I am so comfortable right now. You know the movies where it's like the main hero is like, oh, they could get shot at any time. But th the movies I'm talking about, you're like, I have no, I, this is just fun to watch because I know they're going to win everything that they do. I'm thinking of Matt Damon in the Jason Bourne franchise. You know what I'm talking about? It's like there is a super sniper in the field across from the house. He blows up a car to distract the guy, and he just jogs just fast enough so that the sniper can't track him and shoot him on his way around the corner. Matt Damon makes it behind him, takes the guy out. No problem. I wasn't nervous. Were you nervous? You weren't nervous. You know what I'm talking about. I'm thinking of Ethan Hunt in Mission Impossible. Mission Impossible. It's not impossible. We all know what's going to happen in the end. He's going to win. He's going to beat the bad guy. I'm thinking of Jackie Chan in every movie, right? In every movie. It's just like he might hurt his fist punching the dude in the face, but he's going to dive through the ladder. He's going to spin the chair around and smack in the back of the guy's head. He's going to jump off a building. He's going to be fine. He's Jackie Chan. You could even make the argument for Wesley in The Princess Bride. You know what I'm talking about? Because Wesley dies... And still stands up at the end of the movie and says, drop your sword, right? You know the, the character. You know the hero. You know the guy I'm talking about. That guy is you. That's what we're getting at. That guy is you. If you're a Christian, you can't be beat. You've got access to and relationship with the same Jesus that Paul was talking about. The same Jesus who met Paul on the road to Damascus. The same Jesus that Paul said to live is Christ. Living means I get to live for him. To die is gain. Dying means I get to be with him. Win, win. No matter what, we win. The same Jesus that Paul knew, you know. Same Jesus that Paul had living inside of him, you do too if you've received him as your Lord and Savior. No matter what, we win. Any enemies lose their power. Your circumstances don't dictate your joy. Your difficulties don't determine the tone of your life. Jesus does. Do you know Jesus? Then no matter what, you win. Nothing you face need take you out because Jesus. Now, does this mean, this last little bit here, does this mean that we're like, yeah, all the time? Like, life is a party. I can't win. I am invincible. No. 
It doesn't mean we always feel that. I mean, even imagine Paul in some of the stories we talked about today. Paul's walking through the marketplace with his buddy Silas, and they're there to share the love and the goodness and the truth of Jesus with the people of Philippi, and this stinking girl behind them won't shut up. She's just, like, interrupting everything they're trying to do, shouting about them, and he's like, I can't take it anymore. Is Paul in that moment like, yeah, Jesus, I win? No, Paul's like, oh, my God, get me out of here. He's so frustrated. So what does he do? He turns around and is like, in the name of Jesus, come out of her. He just can't take it anymore. Gets him in trouble, goes to prison. We, all, we know the story. Paul wasn't thrilled all the time. Paul wasn't on top of the world all the time. Paul experienced discouragement and frustration just like we do. This isn't a every day of my life I'm going to be the top of the mountain. This is as I go through the mountains and the valleys of my life, I know that nothing I I'm going to take that, say that differently. As I go through the mountains and the valleys of life, I know that I win. I know the end of the story. I know the Savior that I serve. I know that whether I live or die, I win. I've got him. There is an undercurrent and a foundation of joy, of peace, of hope, of life. What bur bubbles and gurgles and exudes out of our lives can be him. It doesn't have to be all the junk. No matter what, we win. I want to invite you to, uh, to stand to your feet with me. We're coming to a close here. Now, I think it was pretty clear from, from the message that the only way we can say that phrase is if we know Jesus. The only way we can say, no matter what, I win, is if we know Jesus. And I'm imagining there's people in this room right now, and I'm imagining there's people watching online. And you're saying, I don't know Jesus yet. Maybe you're not saying yet, yet. Maybe you're not even at that point. You don't know Jesus. You're like, I, I, I get it. I understand the principle that we're talking about here, but I don't, I don't know it personally. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say, why not? Why not today? I want to invite you to take that step into relationship with Jesus that will mark you not just for this life. It won't only give you this perspective of no matter what I win during this life, but for the life to come. For eternity, you are marked. You are set apart for the God of the universe. This isn't some fringe idea. This isn't something that I'm making up. This is something that God wrote in his word thousands of years, over a thousand, thousands of years period, that our only hope is Jesus, the one who created humanity, the one that created the universe is saying, our only hope, my children, the only way you make it through this is with me. So why not today? It's actually a very simple thing. I remember, how do I, how do I tell somebody about Jesus? How do I tell somebody about how to be saved to be a Christian? I remember this with the ABCs. I might have shared this with you before. The ABCs. A, admit that you're a sinner. Admit you're a sinner. It's, it's coming to that revelation, that realization. Acknowledging, I am not perfect. Probably not that difficult to realize. I'm not perfect. I know that I don't follow God, God's will for my life, God's purpose. I don't follow him perfectly. I mess up. I admit that I'm a sinner. A. B. Believe that Jesus is God, the way it says in the word of God, and that he died on the cross to forgive you of your sins. Believe that Jesus is God. He died on the cross to forgive you of your sins. That's the B. And the C is confess your sins to him. And as you confess, you're saying, no, I don't want that anymore. I confess these as sin, Lord. I'm turning from those. And the other part of C is choose to give him the control of your life. A, admit you're a sinner. B, believe Jesus is God and that he died on the cross to forgive you of your sins. C, confess your sins to him and choose to give him the control of your life. A, B, C. Why not take that step today?
Jesus, we admit we're sinners. We mess up. We don't do the right thing all the time, Lord, and sometimes we actively do the wrong thing. Forgive us. We believe that you are God. Jesus, that you came to earth, you lived a perfect, sinless human life, and you gave your life up for us on the cross at Calvary. Judas stayed dead. You rose from the dead, conquering sin, conquering death. I believe, Lord. And I confess my sins to you, Lord. I give you all the particulars, all the details that I can think of, Lord. I, I confess them to you and say, I'm turning from those things and I'm choosing to give you the control of my life. Would you come into my life? Would you help me? Forgive me, save me, set me free. I want to live my life for you. In Jesus' name. If you've made that decision just now, you prayed that prayer for the first time, or you rededicated your life after a time away, I want to say congratulations. That is the biggest decision that you could ever make in your life. And you can now say, no matter what, I win. Because Jesus has got me. In life and in death, he's got me. If you made that decision, in a few minutes, I'm going to invite you to come to the front. As I'm inviting other people, it's not going to be singling you out in any way, but to come to the front and receive prayer so we can stand with you and walk with you as hopefully your church family. Now, everybody else who's already made that decision to follow Jesus, you might need a shift in perspective. I just want to invite everybody's eyes to be closed. And if you're willing to raise your hands to the Lord, it's a, it's a position of surrender. It's a position of, of welcoming whatever he wants to give you, whatever he wants to do in you. I just want to encourage you to hold those hands up to the Lord. You might need a shift in perspective from pessimism to optimism. You always look at things, you often look at things from the negative side, and you're like, no, Jesus, I want to have this, I always win with you perspective. Maybe you need a shift from the fear of losing to the expectation of winning. There's a, it's a whole different way to live when you're always acting because I'm afraid I'm going to lose as compared to you're always acting because I'm expecting to win. That's a whole different way to live. Maybe you want to shift from feeling defeated to feeling victorious. Or you want to shift from feeling self-absorbed to recognizing it's not about me, it's all about you, God. If that's you, would you just welcome him into that area? right now as I pray. Lord, I pray your blessing and your favor on your kids in this room. I pray for a new perspective, a new understanding of who you are and who they are in you, Lord. And having a shift of this perspective can change so much, can change everything in our lives, Lord. If we realize, we really deep down realize no matter what, I win. Lord, let your joy flood your people and your peace and your love and your hope and your optimism, just like we saw it flowing out of Paul two years into an imprisonment, chained to a Roman guard, not free. And yet he was so free. Lord, I pray for a new perspective for your church. I pray for a new joy and a new peace and a new hope and a new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, God is good. All the time. God didn't, God didn't invite us to lose. <laughs> he invited us to win. We win in him. Amen? amen? Amen. Lord, bless them as they go. In Jesus' name. I hope to see you tonight at Power and Presence. Let's go in the confidence and joy of Jesus this morning. If you need prayer for anything, I want to invite you to come up, receive prayer. Our ministry teams are coming up in just a moment. Let's pray and let's believe in God is going to, going to shift in us whatever he wants to. Love you guys. See you next week. God bless.